This week, Kayla Lee from IBM is with us to discuss quantum computing. Then Vadim Yubashevsky from IBM joins us to talk about quantum safe cryptography. Finally, Matt Johansson from Reddit joins us to talk about the benefits of being vulnerable. We've got three great interviews today on this special episode of Enterprise Security Weekly for RSA Week. This is a Security Weekly production for security professionals by security professionals. Please visit securityweekly.com forward slash subscribe to subscribe to all the shows on our network. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where we talk security vendors and aren't afraid to name names. It's Enterprise Security Weekly. When organizations face poor web performance, challenges building modern applications at scale, or need to reduce operational and development costs, they turn to Fastly. Fastly's distributed edge network means your business can unleash its growth potential without worrying about scaling your infrastructure, whether for growth of users, transaction volume, or geographic expansion. Get the speed, security, and edge cloud innovation you need to deliver profitable and engaging experiences. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash Fastly for more information or to speak to an expert. Welcome to Enterprise Security Weekly and happy National Teach Children to Save Day. This is episode 315, pre-recorded on Wednesday, April 12th, but it will be published on Thursday, April 27th, 2023, during the RSA conference. I'm your host, Adrian Sanabria, and joining me is the Czar of Zero Trust, the captain of content, Katie Teitler. How are you doing, Katie? I'm um, well, although I did look up what national day it was today, and that wasn't on my list. I was hoping that it would be National Grilled Cheese Sandwich Day. I didn't even, that wasn't on my list. <laughs> yeah, I, I, National I think Grilled were... Cheese Sandwich Day, National Big Wind Day, which at least where I am in the Massachusetts area, it is definitely windy. So a little prescience there, maybe on the part of the calendar people. I, I saw National Gummy Bear Day. There's, there's, there's all kinds of stuff. It's crazy. All kinds of stuff. Also joining us is the master of mobile, the professor, the professor of privileged activity, Mr. Lee Neely. Oh, it's nice to be a privileged person. It is National Grilled Cheese Sandwich Day on April 12th, National Colorado Day, and National Twelves Day. Just in case you were needing oh. more national days. But this is not going live on April 12th, so I did not use April 12th. Well, um, he fooled that's, us. Lee. That's, <laughs> yeah, yeah. This yep. is a pre-record, yep. so yeah, uh, people hearing this, I want uh, I want them to hear it on the day that it comes out, right? Well, dokey dokey. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what's funny is the. Uh, when I saw National Teach Children to Save Day, is it bad that the first thing I thought of is saving files? Like, I, I know it's, you know, <laughs> immediately it occurred to me that it's, it's, it's about saving money, which is really important and, uh, and good to do. But uh, the first thing that hit me is, is just the first time I saw my kids using Microsoft Word and, you know, they poured two hours into something and it's still an untitled document. <laughs> Save it. Well, per, Give it a name. perhaps you got distracted by that. It, that the twenty seventh is also National Take Our Daughters and Son to Work Day, and so you got there thinking you about I, work. Maybe as a content maybe person, it. I can agree one hundred percent that saving your writing or auto saving your writing is almost as important as saving your money. And uh, I, th I think one of those we have to worry about more than the other these days, you know, especially <laughs> well, if you're using Google Drive or something like that, like auto saving is pretty much a thing everywhere now, right? Well, you can talk about it because it's all, uh, at, at dinner because it's also National Prime Rib Day and National Tell a Story <laughs> Day. So I think we got it covered. You're, you're trying to trying to weave all the days together, Lee, huh? Well, duh. <laughs> That that would be a challenge uh, if if we tried to weave them all together uh, every time we. Did well, we this. could we all could right. weave um, National Save uh, Teacher Children to Save Day into ransomware prevention as well, right? Because if you Damn save afraid. your backups, yeah. you don't have to worry as much about ransomware. So see, we we can make anything fit. <laughs> 
And, and I'm sure our friends right. from IBM can help us with a quantum computer for that. Well, one of the things we need to make fit is the announcements. So I'm going to run into a run through a quick announcement here, and then we'll get to today's uh, first interview. As a member of the Security Weekly community, we are pleased to offer you 20% off your InfoSec World 2023 tickets. Join a community of over 2,000 security professionals and innovators at InfoSec World on September 25th through 27th at Disney's Coronado Springs Resort. Experience world-class learning and networking through enlightening keynotes, informative panel discussions, interactive breakout sessions, hands-on workshops, and more. Register today at securityweekly.com forward slash InfoSec World 2023 using code ISW23 SecWeek20. All right. <laughs> and um, for our first interview today, we are focused on quantum, com quantum computing, which is something I've been wanting to do for a while. Uh, something we like to do on the show is take a topic that, that's new or emerging, uh, especially when it starts popping up in the news more, and, uh, and bring some guests on to help us understand it better. And <clears throat> thanks to IBM, uh, we've been able to do it pretty much exactly like I envisioned it. I wanted our first interview to be about kind of the fundamentals of quantum computing. Uh, what it can do, you know, where it's at today, you know, what, what the roadmap looks like for it. And then uh, our second interview, uh, we, we've got two guests from IBM today, uh, is going to dive into the security implications of, of quantum computing on, uh, on encryption specifically. So also we've got a third interview today, so make sure to stick around for that. It's not quantum related, but will be worth checking out. So today I'm super excited to talk with Kayla Lee, who's going to help us understand the quantum computing uh, side of this, help us uh, with some build a foundation here for us to understand uh, uh, the second interview we'll be doing a, a bit later. Kayla's a global lead of partner experience and operations with IBM Quantum. Her role is to help grow the quantum ecosystem through research, exploration, and partnerships. Welcome, Kayla. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm a little disappointed my introduction didn't come with a, a fancy title. Maybe next time. Yeah, so even even we were going to have a, a co-host on here the first time. It usually takes, like, I got to get to know you before I can come up with the uh, the, the fancy lead-in on the, on the titles here. <laughs> so maybe, All right, excuse maybe for another we... meeting. Yeah, when we have you back, when we have you on a second time, uh, maybe a follow-up uh, interview, we'll, we'll have a, a fancy title for you. So let's, let's start off with your background because, you know, for me, I've been working with computers uh, for a long time, for, for uh, I'm not going to say how long, <laughs> and, and working for them, with them professionally for, for a while. And quantum computing is just uh, is totally alien to me. And one of the challenges I've had is every time I try to learn about it, to read about it, you know, they kind of start with like quantum mechanics and explaining how a quantum computer works and things like that. And I never seem to uh, get to the point to where I feel like I understand what what it what people are actually doing with it. Like, what can you do with a quantum computer? But before we jump into those details. I want to understand, um, you know, with your background, you've got a, a background in, in biology and you've got a PhD in systems biology. What, what pulled you into computing and specifically into quantum computing? Uh, that's a great question. So I definitely would say I ended up here a little bit on accident, uh, but also on purpose. Uh, my background is that my dad used to work at IBM. And so because of that, I've always just been super fascinated by technology, uh, by IBM as an older tech company, but one that's always leading the way and re-envisioning uh, what technology means to them. Uh, so I studied systems biology for graduate school. For those who don't know, systems biology is really how can we use computer science, physics, and math to answer biological problems. Um, so for me, there's always been this underlying foundation of technology. Um, I was just thinking about biology problems versus now I'm thinking more about emerging technology. So my career at IBM started really focused on healthcare life science research. I wanted to stay at the intersection of business and science and technology. Um, and this was at the time IBM was also starting to form 
a bit more of their quantum computing as a business. And so for decades, IBM has been in the space of thinking about quantum information science and hopefully uh, hoping that at one point there would be quantum computers. Uh, In 2016, we actually put the first quantum computer on the cloud. And since then, we've really been building what the industry looks like. And so my focus has shifted from how do we solve biological problems with technology um, to now how do we work with partners and other people on answering just that, what is quantum computing and why should they start thinking about it now? So it sounds like biology, life sciences, that's one of the use cases that you would use a quantum computer for. Eventually, definitely down the line. I think we have a a few other use cases that we expect to be uh, more immediate, um, but I definitely think that there's opportunity to, to think about how we could use quantum computers and biological problems. So, so let's talk, we call them quantum computers. Do, do you think of them as, is that the right way to think of them? You know, are they like a, a special purpose supercomputer? You know, what can you do with a quantum computer today? Sure. So let's talk about why they're quantum computers first. Um, okay. There are different ways one might build a quantum computer, but the big technology is that instead of having a bit, you have something called a qubit or a quantum bit. Um, these qubits are a little funky. So rather than looking like something we're used to seeing, so something binary, um, instead they can operate in this really large state space. At IBM, the way we get them to operate like that is by making them extremely cold. Uh, So imagine something that's 15 millikelvin. Um, To put that into perspective, outer space is 2.7 Kelvin. at zero Kelvin, nothing moves. And so it's extremely cold. Um, And at that temperature, we start observing some really interesting properties. And so those uh, are the properties that we're able to take advantage of in order to see these complex calculations. Um, And so they are a computer, um, but instead think about the fact that we're at this stage where um, it's our job to really manipulate what that qubit is doing. Um, We can then take those measurements and convert that to something that looks like zeros and ones, so more like your classical computer, um, rather than being deterministic, it's probabilistic. Um, And because it's behaving in that way, we're allowed to sample a larger search space. Um, And so absolutely, it's a computer. The reason why we care about the quantum mechanics part of it is because that's what makes it behave a little bit different. Um, and then there's some interesting math that underlies it, and that's why we're able to to solve problems in a different way. Hmm. So, Lee, I, I heard you. Hmm. Did you, <laughs> you, you have a comment there? Well, I was going to ask. Um, actually, when you were going through your background, I half, halfway expected you to t- touch on high-performance computing. Uh, working at Lawrence Livermore, we do a lot of high-performance computing. And uh, we use we create general purpose as opposed to specialized, and so my thinking was: um, Is quantum still super specialized? Are we able to make a general purpose computer that can be used for all kinds of applications? I realize quantum narrows the field, but say if you remember a few years ago, the the, the Japanese built a supercomputer, but all it was good for was uh, climate modeling, as opposed mm-hmm. to something you could do a lot more types of experiments on. So quantum computers, we don't expect them to replace classical computers. And I think that that's a really important principle just to understand. Our classical computers are really, really good at a lot of things. Um, And so we want to continue to use them in that way. Um, And instead, some people think about quantum computers as a coprocessor. At IBM, we're starting to think about like what does quantum-centric supercomputing look like? Um, I imagine a world where it plays alongside your high performance compute environments. The mm-hmm. people that have made the most use of quantum computers so far um, are some of the national labs that are already doing a lot of work in the space. Uh, and so instead, mm-hmm. I think that we'll definitely be in a paradigm where it acts as a coprocessor. Um, and because of that, there are certain problems that we expect for quantum computers to be able to solve better than classical computers. Uh, An example I I love to use is 
factoring. Uh, so factoring is really hard for classical computers to do. Uh, it's easy when the numbers are small, uh, but as those numbers get bigger, uh, it becomes computationally complex to solve that problem. And this audience would understand that uh, even more than I, because they care a lot about security. Um, and RSA encryption is actually based on the fact that it's really hard to factor really, really big numbers. Um, and so quantum computers are, are something where we hope that and there's actually been theoretical proofs that say uh, a quantum computer can factor really large numbers uh, better and faster than a classical computer can. Now, of course, we're not quite there yet. The technology is still new, um, but it's one of those examples uh, where we know theoretically that quantum computers will actually be able to solve that problem faster. So a follow-up question, well, because I have a lot, but I don't want to steal the, steal the show, <laughs> um, is I remember back when we used to get supercomputers, that we they get delivered, and the only thing they would actually do is 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 run the benchmark. And that was it. You, anything else, we pretty much had to write our own code for or work with the vendor to get code to work that worked on other supercomputers, et cetera. And it was just a maturity thing. Now you get one delivered and it, it you know, you can food a, a basically a, a, win, a Unix Linux variant OS on it and go start going to town. You still got to write code that does the vector or whatever processing it's engineered for. So I'm thinking in that kind of a, a timeline, where are we with quantum? I understand them being coprocessors, but are they still very, very, very tight? Are they, they able to do more? We're just learning. Um, we're you know, definitely just pretty mark. close. <laughs> we're pretty close to that paradigm you just mentioned. Uh, so the computers still take up a lot of space. They're pretty big. Mm -hmm. um, we actually could show you a picture they look like a giant cylinder that protects the inside of the quantum computer. We put them in a big box. There are room temperature electronics that go behind it. Um, so they're still huge systems. Um, and mm -hmm. we're absolutely still figuring out, um, I'd say, even some of the right benchmarks. Um, and so okay. we're early. We're learning. A, a lot of the people that we're working with are thinking about things from a research perspective. Um, and to put it into perspective, the field is just small. Uh, historically, people in the fields were all quantum information scientists, theorists, uh, physicists. Mm -hmm. uh, we've seen in the past five years uh, that more people are gaining interest in the field. And so in addition to physicists, we have engineers, we have computer scientists, we have mathematicians. Um, I expect as we continue to just grow awareness in the field, um, as it becomes more interdisciplinary, um, that we'll also see some maturity. Uh, but we've also seen a lot of growth already in the past few years. Uh, but the field is new. In fact, uh, the qubit that we use at IBM, that technology was first discovered at Yale uh, only in 2007. So it's not like we're Damn. dealing with ancient technology at all. Um, no, no, no. We're thinking about research. We have to build the systems and uh, it's engineering, it's cold. Uh, there's just a lot of science we've got to figure out to get there i'll make a quick was, comment before i turn it back over and that is sure. you know when it comes to the size back when we first started with our first cray computers the cooling was as big or bigger than the cray itself although it was in a back room and i anticipate ibm will solve the size problem so nobody should think that's a bad thing at this point actually one of the things uh when people ask like what was the big difference that to quantum computing from a science project to an industry, uh, the cryo, and, and just thinking about cryogenics and being able to make those systems smaller and better has been one of mm -hmm. the big accomplishments that we've made. And so there are oh, yeah. just a, was that a question? I said, no, I, I, did, I was gonna say, I didn't mean to take anything away, but I stepped on my tongue. <laughs> No, I was going to say, though, just the cryogenics alone has been such a huge accomplishment in the field. And there are only a few companies that are building life-size dilution refrigerators that can control these electronics. Um, and so there's also a lot of different pockets in the field uh, that we also need to advance. So thinking about the cryogenics, thinking about room temperature electronics, and all of that will eventually contribute to making those systems smaller, but also more practical and useful uh, for your everyday person. 
Yeah, I saw a great uh, video the other day. Uh, just came out the other day uh, by uh, Cleo Abram and uh, MKBHD, where they went into IBM and you know they got uh, to yeah. take a. Did you see that video? I did. I'm not sure if anyone else has. Yeah, yeah, I'll have to. We'll, we'll have to share that uh, somewhere here uh, when when this comes out. But yeah, it was it was great to get to to see it, and I thought it was a really good like 15 minute ish explainer video on quantum. It might've been longer than that. It might've been 20, 25 minutes, but, um, but yeah, that was, uh, I love that that came out right before our conversation. Cause that kind of helped me, uh, understand things a bit more and, and have a better idea of what, what kind of questions I should ask. But I, I wanted to jump back. You mentioned earlier, um, you know, the, the, you describe the differences as deterministic versus probabilistic. So, so does that mean? But, but you also mentioned that there's a component in the the quantum computer that that tries to uh, translate things into more binary terms. But when when I when you ask a quantum computer a question, is it kind of like instead of getting a yes or a no, you get like an eighty percent yes or eighty percent no? Something is that a better way of thinking about that? Kind of. So imagine you have a system. Let's say that to map the system to a quantum computer, we want to use three qubits. Uh, that's a, a pretty easy number for us in this hypothetical exercise. Uh, a qubit at the point where you measure it will either be a zero or a one. Um, and so that happens like once it's measured, it collapses on either a zero or one. But before it's measured, it's occupying this huge state space. And so oftentimes uh, we actually represent a qubit as a sphere. And so you could imagine that at any point in time before it's measured, it could be any state um, on the surface of that sphere. When it collapses, it'll collapse into either a zero or one. Um, and so that's the part that still translates to binary. Um, but whenever I send a problem to a quantum computer, um, it's essentially, searching that space um, and you do it repeatedly. And so these are something we call shots. Um, but imagine I, I send a problem to it. I search the space. I do that problem multiple times. Um, and then at the end of the day, I get some distribution um, where over that distribution, you might imagine um, my first qubit landed on zero, eight out of the a thousand times my second qubit ended on one, eight out of a thousand times, and then that last one ended on zero, eight out of a thousand times. So now you have this distribution of zero, one, zero, um, and that's what you actually are reading out on your classical computer. So that distribution of zeros and ones at the end. Um, the reason why the number of qubits here is interesting um, is because you're loading your entire problem onto the system at a time, runs through a series of operations, you measure them, and then you get this distribution. Um, with your classical computer, oftentimes you're thinking about this in a way where um, maybe you don't send your entire problem in, so instead you're asking one question followed by another. So some people like to say it's more sequential. Um, that's mm -hmm. not exactly true, but for the, the exercise, it, it, it does work like that. Um, and so at the end, you have this distribution. Um, you could imagine at the bottom that you have different outcomes that are then mapped to your zeros and ones. Um, and so if you have the one over your zero, one, zero outcome, like that's your answer. Um, and so it doesn't seem that interesting when you only have three qubits, but imagine a system where you have 100 qubits. Um, that's a really big problem. Um, and because of that, you're able to sample kind of all of the permutations of zero and one. Uh, and so oftentimes when people start talking about the potential of quantum computers, I like to think about like with each qubit that we add, we're actually able to like increase the search space. And so that's where the potential is in those large complex problems, problems where as you increase one input, the output explodes. So that's why we often talk about things like optimization, like molecular modeling. Uh, people often talk about supply chain, um, but these are all problems where 
if you just add one input, the output starts to get exponentially larger. I um, mean, those are the things that quantum computers are well suited to, to think about. So, pardon me, so much of this, you know, we've been talking about quantum for a few years, it's a nascent field, you're talking about the potential, but what about right now? What kinds of companies should be starting to look into this? And what are some practical applications to get people and companies started with quantum? Yeah. So there are your tech companies that are building quantum computers. They're thinking about platforms that you need. Uh, you have startups that are really thinking more about specific parts of your hardware stack. Uh, so they might be building quantum computers. They might be thinking about building different software or middleware. Uh, they're also very interested in applications. Uh, but as far as end users, companies that have really complex uh, computational problems are probably the best to get started now. Um, and then as time goes on, as the technology matures, we definitely expect for more people to get involved. Uh, so one of my favorite examples of work that companies are doing now is Boeing. Uh, they're really interested in just understanding corrosion. Um, it impacts their systems a lot. Um, it's something that on a molecular level, we're still trying to figure out, like, what are different materials we might need to improve corrosion? What are just different things that we can think about um, to improve that for them? And so we're working with Boeing. Um, they're definitely still doing research now. So they have a team that is conducting research, writing research papers, thinking about how the algorithms that we have today um, might be impactful for their work. And so that's one example. Um, another example is work that we're doing with uh, JSR. And so they're very focused on thinking about uh, just like the overall semiconductor industry. Um, and so for them, they're thinking about what are different computing solutions that might exist for solving hard chemical engineering problems. Uh, but you'll notice something in common with those two companies is that they're both interested in thinking about uh, materials and, and chemistry problems. Um, and the nature of quantum computers make them really well suited to solve these like quantum mechanical types of problems. Great, thank you. And, 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 and talking a bit more, you know, to follow up on on uh, Katie's question, um, you know, how you, you mentioned that uh, IBM has this as a service that you can use today. Uh, what, what does that process look like? Is, is it as easy to get started with as any other cloud service? Is and I'm I'm kind of curious about like like the speed of it. Is it something where when you submit a problem to your quantum computer, like you, you know, traditionally when we think of cloud services, there there's just like thousands of computers that that you scale up through. Like like, is there a queue? How long do I have to wait for the answer to come back? You know, and 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 you know what? How how am I programming for this quantum computer? Ah, those are fun questions. So yes, it's as easy as it is using other compute resources. One of the things that IBM did, and I mentioned this back in 2016, was put a quantum computer that anyone could use on the cloud. Uh, this was important because prior to doing that, you basically had to build a dilution refrigerator and a quantum computer in a lab in order to even have access to it. Uh, and so right now, for some of our smaller qubit systems, anyone can access them. Uh, there is a queue. I couldn't tell you how long to wait, um, but I can say that the, our partners that are paying us money are prioritizing that queue. So that's one of the ways that we're working to just prioritize and give benefits to our partners. Um, if you wanted to get started on programming, we have a software development kit called Kiskit. Um, some people call it Quiskit because it, but I say Kiskit, it rhymes with biscuit. Um, this is a software development kit that's built on Python. So it's a familiar language for people that have written code before. Um, but it's also a, a pretty conversational language. And so because of that, I'd say that even a newcomer could kind of pick up quickly on, on what you're doing. 
Um, and then beyond that, there are libraries that have been built. So that let's say you're interested in getting started with an optimization problem. Uh, we have libraries, we have tutorials so that you can at least get started there. Um, I'd say that for people that are really interested in pushing the boundaries of what you can do today, uh, that probably requires a little bit more work and a little bit more research. Um, there are lots of different ways to approach building a quantum computing problem. Uh, so the first is just understanding your problem, making sure that it, it maps to a quantum computer, uh, and then thinking about how you would actually map it to the quantum computer. Um, oftentimes, we're still building small toy problems today. And so if you have a, a thousand truck fleet optimization problem that you want to do, uh, our quantum computers aren't big enough for that yet. Uh, but you could think about ways to reduce that problem and then experiment on our quantum computers. Um, IBM has a, a huge fleet of quantum computers ranging from like one or five qubits, so our smaller systems. Uh, and last November, we actually announced uh, our 433 qubit quantum computer. Uh, so that is the largest quantum computer that's been announced to date. Um, Right now, it's it's kind of behind closed doors, so our partners are the ones that get the opportunity to play with that. Um, but beyond that, um, we're definitely thinking about ways for more people to get their hands on it. Um, and so those are kind of why we do a lot of the partnerships that we do. It's why we have a lot of the open access resources. Um, it's it's our goal to get as many people as possible just interested and exciting and engaged in quantum computing um, because we think the more people that we're working with, uh, the more partners we can bring in, uh, the quicker we'll actually get to a, a place of really doing some interest in quantum science. So you, you touched you, on two... Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, okay. No, you go ahead. You mentioned the SDK and getting started in using Python. Do you also offer uh, some training for people that don't, may not understand how to how to program a quantum coprocessor? To you know, because just like you know, conventional versus uh, vector programming, very different. Uh, absolutely. So one of the things, if you were really interested in getting started. Um, Along with our, our software kit, there just comes a, a lot of really great documentation to think inline code tutorials, uh, but we also have an open source textbook. And so this is something that uh, IBMers, but also the community have built uh, to really build up that knowledge. And so it's great. There's a three hour course if you just wanted an introduction to quantum computing. Uh, there's a more awesome. detailed course if you cared about quantum simulation. Um, but I'd say one of the the fun things that we've introduced over the past few years is this global summer school. Uh, and so in this, we're working with thousands of people from around the world. Uh, it's a two week intensive course that happens in the summer. Uh, and students are working in labs together. We have huge discord servers, um, but essentially it brings together this global community. Uh, and those are people, some that have just gotten started, others that have been quantum enthusiasts for years. Uh, but there are definitely a lot of ways to engage in those materials. Um, for those that are more focused on developing, we have a, a developer certification, um, but the resources are there. Um, it's really about making the time to, to learn and understand where they can take you. Yeah, so, so you mentioned before two different paths I, I kind of want to go down and explore. And I, I think we'll talk about... Um, well, you, you've already been touching on it. You know, what 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 is your day to day job at IBM like? Like like how do you how do you get people more interested in you know uh, playing with quantum, trying it out? How, how do you how do you get more partners engaged? You know, individuals. Like, are you just focused on individuals, or is or is it uh, you know more of those paying partners? Is it all of the above? And, and what kind of stuff are you doing to draw people in to get people excited about it? Sure. We have two big initiatives on building our community. Uh, the first is our community initiative. And so those are the, the people that are really focused on the individuals. Um, they are the ones that have built the open source textbook. Uh, they host these large global events. We have something called like a Kiskit hackathons or different things. 
I'd say that our community outreach is really similar to the way that folks might engage other developer communities. Um, and then the other side of the house are our partners that we're working with. Um, they are part of the IBM Quantum Network. And so essentially this is a 200 plus network of Fortune 500 companies, academic institutions, national labs, startups, uh, your ISVs and GSIs. Uh, and so I primarily serve uh, the members of the IBM Quantum Network, um, where one of my main roles is actually making sure that they find value in partnering with IBM. And so we're providing uh, these really advanced quantum systems, but how they build their ecosystems, uh, the content that they leverage to take advantage of not just our open systems, but really those large systems, how they're getting the most out of their workflows. Uh, it's my job to make sure that once people become part of the IBM quantum network, uh, that they stay partnered with IBM. Um, and so, as I mentioned, uh, we're working with people like Boeing, but we also have a big academic network. And so North Carolina State is one of our hubs where they're really interested in building like up their local ecosystem. Uh, the same goes with Arizona State. They care a lot about cybersecurity and thinking about uh, just the future of quantum computing. And so they built their own ecosystem. Um, but it's, it's my job really to serve uh, and support those clients once they're part of the network. Okay. Kind of like uh, I would think of it as customer success right? yep. from what I do. That's yeah. one of the words I throw around every now and then. Yeah. <laughs> and, and and the other path, the, the other thing uh, you had me thinking about, you're talking about all the different quantum computers that IBM has built, you know, kind of, uh, you know, and uh, up to the, I think you said 433 qubits uh, that, that you have right now. How do quantum computers scale? Because some of the breeding I did, it seems like it's not uh, um, as linear as as uh, you know classic uh, uh, transistor based uh, uh, computers scale. Mm. Like like you know, it's not a you know one one qubit to two qubit isn't isn't like a hundred percent increase. Uh, I as as I understand mm. it, and then as kind of the follow up question to that. Is there a clear um, kind of Moore's law emerging in how fast uh, IBM is is able to increase its performance every year? Is do, do you well? Yeah, I mean you've got a roadmap, so I, I imagine that there is some idea of a of a pattern here. Yeah. So the scaling question is interesting. Um, so in a perfect world it actually would increase the capacity with each qubit that we add. And so you could imagine that if I add a single qubit that I'm increasing the space exponentially, the challenge is our quantum computers aren't perfect. Um, and so instead there's a lot of noise that goes with it. Um, if I could walk through kind of just the challenges we have, there's connectivity, fidelity, um, how certain we are that the quantum computer is doing what we want. Um, and so we're in this era currently where the quantum computers aren't perfect. We don't have something called error correction, which uh, would essentially allow us to kind of control for those errors, um, but we're getting there. And so we're at a path now where before our 433 qubit system, we had 127 qubits. And so um, our next plan by 2025 is to have a 4,000 qubit system. Um, and with each increase, um, we're reducing the error, we're reducing the noise for some parts of the problem, um, but then we're introducing other challenges. And so how do we ensure that when you put 433 qubits on a single chip, uh, that we're able to manage the noise and error. Uh, and the question, the answer is maybe we can't. So let's start thinking about chip modularity and how chips might talk to each other. Um, but we're, we're figuring all of that out. Um, and that's actually what the roadmap really walks through is um, these are the key milestones that we think we need to make so that we can have a thousand, two thousand and beyond qubits 
um, so that we can really start doing some interesting work. Um, and at each milestone, um, we're solving big science questions. Uh, and then just to address the question on like a, an equivalent to Moore's law, I think we're still figuring out exactly what that is. Uh, historically, we use something called quantum volume, which really took into account all of those errors and said, this is the performance of a quantum computer. Um, but even things like benchmarks and the best way to measure it, um, I'd say that those are also still things that as an industry, we need to figure out how to align on. Um, so, yeah. So it sounds like maybe the answer, like talking about error correction, is maybe you have to uh, cluster a bunch of qubits together and, and then, you know, take like the the output, maybe give them all the same problem, you know, and, and again, you were talking about, um, uh, you know, the way you use them, you know, you have um, collections of uh, distribution of, of answers. Um, so, so is that kind of the answer? Like, like you need more qubits because the more qubits you have, then maybe you can start to do that that kind of error correction, and and like deal with the the noise problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd say yes, and uh, so it's not just about scale, right? We've developed technology that's about how we could control the qubits, how we can manage the errors, um, and that's part of quantum computing. It's part of that science that we have to figure out. Um, to get there, we're thinking about how you might integrate both quantum and classical. And so even some of the approaches that we've taken, it hasn't just been on the hardware. There are also software problems uh, that we can solve and think about to get there. Um, and so in our future systems, and, and this we kind of talk about on the roadmap, um, you could imagine our quantum processor working alongside like a CPU and a GPU. Um, and so these are like future architectures um, that we definitely think will be necessary to get to just this place of quantum advantage, right? Where we're really able to do something different. Um, but the approach that we take to get there might look different. And so, like I said, in that roadmap, uh, there's one point we where we have a really large chip. Uh, and then we kind of take a step back and we change some of the interconnects and how they're talking to each other. We make the chip smaller. Um, and that reduces the error, but also changes some of your connectivity. And so there are just a lot of different things that we're trying to manage uh, to get to these larger systems. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. Oh. You're, you're right here at the very beginning of it. You know, like like they they haven't quite figured out how to get. Uh, you know, it, I I don't know. It just seems really exciting, like where where you are yeah. right now, and and the fact that you get to. Uh, you get to be part of this uh, this early in the stage of a like a new computing paradigm. It's really neat. Oh yeah, no, I definitely have one of the coolest jobs in the world. Hell yeah! So I was I was doing some look up at what my you know what I found around my employer on what they're doing in the quantum space, and it is oh you know, it's easy to get sucked into the ra that rabbit hole. But they had done some research on the on the qubit errors, and they said as much as anything else. Uh, cosmic rays or other electromagnetic uh, frequency radiation is uh, can be used to flip the qubit states. So it sounds like we're going to have to come up with a whole new level of shielding for quantum computing to help with the error bit uh, problem, which is interesting. Sort of yeah, so, so different qubit technologies leverage different mechanisms of control. Uh, so our qubits are are manipulated with microwaves. And so you imagine sending these microwave pulses down to the qubit, it then causes them to do something. You have some resonator that reads it out. Um, and that's what we do. Uh, you could imagine that people that use different like qubit topologies, so ion traps um, or other things that they might mm -hmm. have a, a different thing that's actually manipulating them. So that all, all depends. Well, I'm thinking that's not stuff even in a standard supercomputing center you've got just lying around. Uh, so, <laughs> well, and uh, you know what? Do. It's You'd kind be of fun. Surprised. But it's kind of fun having these new requirements just to see how we how we can implement them and, and retrofit our data centers and what they look like. And just, you know, it's just sitting there from a, I, from a cyber perspective, I'm called in from time to time to, you know, physically check out some of the stuff they're doing. And it's always amazing the new 
physical technology we have to support these more and more advanced computing. So I'm I'm looking forward to seeing it and putting my hands on it because this this is really exciting. Yeah, I definitely agree. And I think that's all the time we have for today. Kayla, thank you so much for joining us on Enterprise Security Weekly today. We do have some uh, some links in the show notes uh, for folks who want to learn more, who want to who want to jump into this. But yeah, thank you so much, Kayla. Uh, anything you want to end on before we wrap? No, just thanks for having me. And maybe to echo some of the things I said earlier, one of the best ways to learn is just to try and to do. Um, so I definitely would recommend folks to get their hands dirty and try to program a quantum computer. Very cool. Yeah, that would be, <laughs> yeah, I think uh, from, from this whole conversation, like that would be my next step. And, and that would be really fun to be able to say that you did that. That would be cool. Yeah. Thanks again. Uh, and stay tuned. When we come back, we're going to embark on the second half of our quantum journey, exploring the impact of quantum computing on encryption with uh, Vadim Yubashevsky from IBM. 